Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and thanks for joining us today at You've Got the Power. Uh, got an interesting topic today. Uh, about a year ago or more, I spoke to a local radiologist to see if he could replicate some imaging of uh, incomplete spinal cord injuries that had been published by uh, one of our old physical therapists who is now a professor at Northwestern. And it was a super interesting study. What it showed at that time was that you could image uh, small amounts of spinal cord damage that had happened in car crash victims, even when they had a normal MRI. And that this helped to uh, not only explain their symptoms, but the fact that you could use a research grade type MRI to show these lesions in the spinal cord that otherwise wouldn't show up was super fascinating. And I thought it might apply to some of the craniocerebral instability patients I saw. So I tried to see if I could set something up with him. It never really seemed to go any place, but more recently he reached out and has set up that imaging now. And uh, so I want to talk about that today. I think it's an interesting topic because you know, we see patients all the time that probably have some level of small amount of spinal cord injury. And uh, getting that diagnosed with imaging can be extremely difficult. So should be an interesting topic today. Again, we'll start with a short lecture and uh, then we'll go from a short lecture into Q&A. You can ask questions about this topic or really anything else again today talking about some new imaging techniques for small amounts of spinal cord injury. So let me go here and share my screen. Okay, looks like that's sharing here. Okay, so we'll get started here. Uh, do some CCI patients have a spinal cord injury? Uh, diffusion tensor imaging of the spinal cord is what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, and while this could apply in lots of different scenarios, one clinical scenario could certainly be this type of angular instability that's been associated with cervical medullary syndrome. Uh, and basically, uh, it's a collapse of the clavoaxial angle, the skull sort of rotating forward, and then the spinal cord kind of draping over the, uh, let me actually get a pen here. So the spinal cord kind of draping over this angle here, and that leading to uh, some damage within the spinal cord. Now, it could also apply to someone who had been in a car crash and may have an incomplete or small spinal cord injury at another level. Um, so either one, I, I'm sort of picking this out today because as this became available uh, early this week, I had a whole bunch of these uh, CCI patients that I had seen where I was very interested in trying to see if there was any evidence of spinal cord damage at that portion of the spinal cord and lower medulla. So to focus just on that kind of CCI, because it's one of those types of CCI that could be associated with spinal cord injury, small amounts of spinal cord injury. This is based on the works of work of Fraser Henderson, which is the reference that you see off to the left there. And you see a more normal clavoaxial angle here of about 150 degrees. Uh, this measurement is the amount of pulling um, strain that we see on the spinal cord. Yeah, I'm not quite sure why. I think this, this does that because I've got a super wide screen. I've seen that happen before. So you may have to put up with some of those crazy uh, horizontal lines there. But anyway, and I've, as the clavoaxial angle gets lower, the strain goes up, still pretty normal at 0.1, um, 130, still 0.1, but we get to 120 and it goes up to 0.2 and we start to see pathological damage or at least levels that could be 
associated with pathological damage and the right patients. And these are going to be patients who don't have a lot of room between that dens and the front of the spinal cord. Uh, so that's the idea here. As the clavoaxial angle goes down, the amount of uh, pulling pressure and actual physical pressure on that portion of the spinal cord goes up. And that could be associated with some physical damage. The problem is, how do you, how do you really tell? You're not going to really be able to tell on a routine MRI. So if you look at a routine MRI, sometimes we can see if the spinal cord has what's what we term myelomalacia, meaning that the spinal cord has areas that um, are bright, um, but we really can't uh, really can't tell uh, otherwise. And there's probably a lot that can happen to the spinal cord without it showing up on a routine MRI at all. So if some of these patients have spinal cord injury, obviously that changes the review here. Um, for example, if there's very little injury to the spinal cord, then we're going to stick with more conservative, non-surgical things. If there's a lot of damage to the spinal cord showing up, then you're going to get much more aggressive surgically. And then probably in the middle, it, it's going to be uh, the patient's decision as to what to do. But it's an important thing to, to know in that patient population. So what are some symptoms of incomplete spinal cord injury? As you can see here, a lot of the symptoms, you know, a lot of these symptoms overlap just with CCI. We tend to see back pain, pressure in your neck, head or back, due to this pulling, uh, weakness in coordination, uh, paralysis in any part of your body. For the most part, our CCI patients don't necessarily have paralysis, but they may have intermittent weakness depending on their head position. And they many certainly suffer from lack of coordination, numbness, tingling, loss of sensation in your hands, fingers, feet, or toes, pretty common in a lot of our CCI patients. Loss of bowel and bladder control, pretty common in a lot of our CCI patients, especially these low CXA type one uh, a patients, difficulty with balance and walking, another common thing. Now, that's not to say that spinal cord pressure causes these in most CCI patients. There are many other explanations for these symptoms in many CCI patients. But it's this curious overlap where in some of these patients where we suspect there could be too much pressure on the spinal cord, it would be great if we had the ability to look at that spinal cord and say, aha, uh, this one over here really seems like it's concerning, whereas these other five patients, not so much. So this is really what piqued my interest um, last year. This was done by a group of authors, which included one of our old physical therapists, James Elliott. Uh, Jim's a brilliant guy. Uh, ultimately, after he left us, he got his PhD. He then did some postdoc work with some of this imaging. Uh, it's published a lot of different imaging studies in whiplash injured patients and uh, is now a professor at Northwestern University of Chicago. And uh, Jim's paper really kind of caught my eye because they were able to use some macromolecular imaging that was more research grade to show that a reasonable number of these patients who weren't getting better after uh, a whiplash injury had some detectable spinal cord injury that would have been totally missed on a routine or even an advanced three Tesla MRI. And so I kind of started a quest to be able to image these injuries because I, I, I knew that I probably have a couple of these patients here and there, but uh, I had no way to sort them. Um, so I had called a local uh, neuroradiologist who I respect, asked him about this. And it was hard. You know, the, the type of imaging that Jim used there is really research grade. It's not used at all in daily clinical practice. Now, he had mentioned back then that we might use diffusion tensor imaging, uh, but he was going to have to look into uh, how practical that would be for these patients. So 
ultimately, he got back to me this week, and thankfully, they have developed a way to do this now to look at the spinal cords of these patients. And they are going to use diffusion tensor imaging. And so I was all excited this week. I probably referred five or six patients over where it would be fantastic to know. And almost all of them were this type 1A um, instability. But it would be fantastic to know in those patients whether or not they were starting to get small amounts of spinal cord injury or not, right? That, that will help us with our clinical uh, decision making there. So the fusion tensor imaging or DTI is an MRI technique that looks at the movement of water molecules in a structure. So if we were up in at a high level, right, and we're seeing a highway like this, you know, we're seeing all the cars go in the same direction. They're all in their little lanes. And we're not going to be able to read the license plates, uh, plates of these cars or maybe sometimes even tell what kind of make or model they are. But we can certainly see the direction they're moving and we can see whether or not there's a traffic jam, uh, for example, or whether or not there's a big accident and there's cars going every which way, or whether or not there's a nice predictable flow of traffic and traffic is moving. Uh, and that's what DTI does with water molecules. It doesn't look at individual water molecules. It looks at the direction they're traveling and are they all traveling just like the traffic in a nice orderly way. And that's because it, it's looking at whether or not those water molecules are staying in their lanes or their fiber tracks, or whether there's been disruption. So you get these really pretty tractography uh, maps when you use DTI, for instance, in the brain. And so you can see disruption in these small fibers and things like brain injury using DTI. Now, this works in the spinal cord, uh, also in some of the brain stuff as well, by measuring something that's called fractional anisotropy. Um, and that sounds super duper complex, um, but it's really not. And again, you know, I explain this to patients and other doctors who have never really used this kind of imaging with that traffic example, right? So for example, we can measure this FA number and it goes from zero to one at various levels um, and places within the spinal cord. So if you have a completely normal spinal cord, that FA number is going to trend towards one because it shows a nice organized flow, just like the traffic that's all the little cars are moving in their lanes the cars represent water molecules here. And everything is as it should be with uh, fluid flowing up and down the spinal cord uh, in very predictable tracks or cars in their lanes, if you will. On the other hand, if we have a traffic jam or if we have an accident where the cars are going every which way, that FA goes towards zero. Uh, and that's a problem. That means there's been some sort of accident that has happened. Um, so just realize that that's sort of the, the kind of thing we're looking for here. Um, so uh, we have high FA on the right, which is our normal spinal cord. All the cars are lined up. They may not be moving very quick, but they're all going the same direction. So that's going to be where we're at our one FA. And then we've got the cars going every which way here on the left, and that's gonna to be towards our zero FA. So this is what this sort of DTI report would look like here. Um, and what we're seeing here, and probably a better thing to, to look at since we just talked about that whole FA thing here is uh, we see here at C5 for this patient that FA dips down, which is the red, um, and the green is, is a normal FA at that level. And that corresponds up here to, and I apologize for all those uh, 
those horizontal lines are coming in there, but it, we can see here that there's a problem with the traffic, if you will, at multiple areas uh, within that cord. So we're starting to see some evidence of damage within the cord. So we've just begun imaging these low CXA patients. Um, you know, when should they be imaged with DTI? That's when this cliboaxial angle approaches 120. Um, not necessarily at 130, the, the pulling is still pretty uh, normal at that level. And when there's really a lot of contact between the dens and the spinal cord and medulla. Uh, and I happened, you know, it was kind of an interesting week. I saw a bunch of these type 1A patients probably five during the entire week, and all of them got DTI imaging because this is going to be very helpful clinically for me to know where they are. Uh, it also could explain some of the patients that we just might want to say you really need to go to surgery right away because there's too much damage occurring here, and I'm too concerned about that ongoing damage in a procedure where we're just trying to tighten down the appropriate ligaments. So, uh, let me take some questions now. I'm going to go ahead and, and stop my sharing and get out of this and see if we've got any questions. Looks like we got a bunch. In action to on the student you spoke with on Wednesday. Don't remember speaking with a student on Wednesday. Uh, urgent update. I'm going to get a hold of anyone to contribute directly briefly. Um, yeah, so just reach out to my email address. Um, this is my email address. I'm typing it in the comments. That one goes to my desk. In the comments, I would just reach out to me uh, directly via email. Mark, do interosseous ligaments limit forward sacral rotation? Uh, do intraosseous ligaments limit forward sacral rotation? They would certainly be involved in any rotation of the sacrum, um, but as would many other ligaments too. So, um, for instance, the short dorsal SI joint ligaments would be involved in that as well, the anterior ligaments. Um, so really any of those ligaments um, that would be on the front or the back of the SI joint, in addition to those intraosseous ligaments. Uh, Rishi, uh, is there anyone Regenix has treated with PSEL or post rejections that had serious complications? For example, severe nerve damage, paralysis, or death from procedures. I understand Centosha is clinically safe for serious and I'm very safety focused. You know, there's no patient that we've treated with PICL or posterior injections that has had severe nerve damage, paralysis, or death. No, uh, that's not uh, been something that's happened at Centeno Schultz. Two questions. Does Centeno Schultz offer BMAC only for posterior injections for CCI, not PICL? If the patient wanted to try a less invasive approach with posterior injections first, would this be possible even if the patient's DMX showed ALR and transverse ligament injury? Uh, yeah, Rishi, we always let patients sort of drive the bus there, meaning that if they uh, have the option of either doing a, a PICL, they also always have the option of, of trying posterior first, and it's fine to use bone marrow for that if, if we explain to the patient the risks and benefits of doing that, uh, and they understand additional expense involved in using bone marrow over platelets, et cetera. So not a problem. I would say that of our PICL eligible patients, we probably have 10 to 20 percent that fall into that category these days that they want to uh, try poster injections first. And I don't think I'd ever go against a patient's um, patient wanting to do that just because as a doctor, it's important uh, to me to, re to, to sort of try to meet patients halfway. And if they're concerned about doing the more uh, invasive procedure, i.e. the PICL, I want them to be fully comfortable before they make that decision. Mark, could annular tears at L4 and L5 cause a forward rotation of the sacrum? Um, that would be harder to envision. 
perhaps L5S1 disk, you might see um, some loss of control or at least some loss of energy transfer from the L5 uh, to the sacrum, but annular tear is specifically unlikely. Uh, it's been advanced by John Gardner. Can cervical cranial syndrome go away on its own, which is chiropractic care? Sure, John. Yeah, we see patients all the time that have cranial cervical syndromes, and I'm sure there's many, many out there that we never see who do really well with NUCA and AL chiropractic, and they never come see us. Um, certainly, uh, in talking to those providers, they've got tons of success stories. It's been advanced by John Gardner. Hi, can a bulge disc cause cervical cranial syndrome or vice versa? If the CCS is treated with PRP, where exactly would you inject? C12 or 34? Well, there is no disc at C12. The first disc would be at C23. Um, you can certainly get irritation of specific nerves uh, that might cause something like craniocervical syndrome. So we've seen patients who have injured, for instance, the C2 dorsal root ganglion due to a C1, C2 traumatic injury. Uh, as far as the C2, 3 disc, the C2, 3 disc, uh, if it refers pain, can refer pain to the head. Um, and as far as causing a craniocervical syndrome with other things like imbalance, uh, less likely at the C2, 3 disc, more likely at the C2, 3 facet joint. Uh, Sarah, how do I see if a person has symptoms of CCI? Heavy head, clicking and popping high up in the skull, TMJ, near constant neck pain, levator scap, and upper trap tightness, as well as history of low back SI joint instability injury. What first steps would you recommend for this patient to seek initial care? Uh, well, the first thing is we'd have to get to an actual diagnosis of craniocervical instability. Uh, certainly, you're, you're describing some symptoms that could be CCI, but that diagnosis would have to be made uh, via physical exam, history, and imaging. Uh, and if the patient can tolerate it, then we would treat both the CCI and the SI joint instability, for example. Um, now, that's not all of our patients, though. Some of our patients would be able to tolerate that much work at once. So probably in two to three out of four, we would do both areas at once. One to two times out of four, because the patient has essentially sensitized and in that fragile egg state, uh, we'd probably have to just start in the neck and then add the other uh, area in at some later date. Uh, Sarah, I had my first PICL procedure on J July 11th. I'm curious about the clock PT. Is that something that needs to be cleared by you to start? Yes, it needs to be cleared by the treating doctor to start. Uh, Regenix, uh, it's been advanced by DB. Um, can NUCA treatments on the neck cause problems with digestion and pain in the upper, upper abdomen? Uh, not that I have seen, I'm certainly no NUCA expert, but not that I have seen. Uh, amen. Hello, Dr. Centeno is a common for CCI patients to feel better while moving, driving instead of sitting. Um, not so common. Most CCI patients would have a hard time turning their head, and usually there's a lot of that in driving. So most of them don't like to drive. Uh, Diana is the best to address severe uh, TMJ disorder with splint before PICL during healing or after. What about PRP? Could you fix TMJ disorder without a splint or PRP in, into the TMJ be enough? My TMJ dot or my TMJ disorder, choking to be a jaw, limited opening, loose face, ear pain, et cetera. Uh, Diana, we frequently treat TMJ um, in a good number of our PICL patients. Um, we generally don't require them to use a splint uh, because usually it's not required or necessary. Now, I did get your email about some very specific things that you could help um, with the extra stability. And if a splint takes those symptoms away, then I think it's reasonable to use one. Uh, it's been advanced by Sherry Cop. Uh, Something really odd and embarrassing has been happening all of a sudden when walking with someone, I find myself constantly walking into them. It's never happened before these last few weeks. Yeah, Sherry, it's pretty common for CCI patients to have proprioceptive issues. That means 
uh, balance, uh, coordination, and knowing where they are in 3D space. So certainly sounds consistent with an upper cervical problem. Uh, Ulysses, if someone has a spinal cord injury, it's because of the ligaments in the front and back, especially the transverse ligaments. Uh, not based on what we were looking at just now. What we're looking at right now, just now, is a type 1A low claboaxial angle, which is generally not caused by transverse ligaments. Uh, that would be more of a type 2A instability. Uh, James, some chiropractors use cranial fixation adjustment techniques release cranial pressure. If I have CCS or CCI, which is causing the cranial pressure is okay to get a cranial flexion adjustment. You know, James, I would only trust low force chiropractors like AO and uh, NUCA chiropractors um, rather than someone trying to do a more traditional adjustment uh, in a patient who has CCI. I think I got that one already, Diana. Finn, have you treated any patients with or for polychondritis? Can PRP be indicated for these autoimmune diseases or will it essentially add fuel to the fire and be a net negative? Um, you know, Finn, I, I just would be curious what it is we're talking about there, meaning that um, is there some thing or test that was done to get to polychondritis, uh, which just basically means a lot of inflammation in the cartilage, um, and or was that more of what I call a black box diagnosis where someone just says, well, you've got pain in a lot of joints, I don't know why, here's a box for you to fit into. So I need to know a, a bit more there. It's been advanced by Harry Winston. I've been having an alarming symptom lately that I never had before, and I'm much too young for something like Alzheimer's in the middle of a sentence, I completely forget what I'm saying. Is that something that happened in CCI? Well, we certainly see CCI patients who have brain fog, yes. Uh, we also see CCI patients that have very poor sleep and a lot, of, uh, a lot of mechanical sleep apnea in CCI patients, all of which could lead to something like you're talking about. And obviously, I would definitely get that looked at from a neurologist standpoint just to make sure there's nothing else going on. Uh, Jennifer, my workers' comp providers pressure me to have a steroid injection in my hip. Is there a potential for a steroid injection in my hip to interfere with PRP I had in my neck last week? Um, yeah, I wouldn't get a steroid injection in my hip if you paid me, well, you probably have to pay me 5 million bucks, maybe 10 million bucks uh, for me to want to do that, meaning that uh, we know that's going to destroy and hurt the cartilage in your hip. We know that if you end up with a subsequent hip replacement for whatever reason, it's going to dramatically increase the chance of the hip replacement failing. It's going to dramatically increase the chance of the hip replacement getting infected. Um, so uh, I would just say no. Um, could it affect um, a PRP injection you had in your neck last week? Yes. Uh, a high dose corticosteroid injection in your hip can cause systemic anti-inflammation. So not a good idea. Uh, I don't know how to say that one. Another sign is C23 slips and the C2 rotation. Not sure what that's referring to. Uh, Bonnie, any significant findings so far with your bursa study? Can you clarify the difference between bursa and panis? Yeah, Bonnie, I think what you're referring to is we had, I had said that I was going to try to uh, block some of these bursa patients. I haven't had a taker yet, so I haven't had a chance to do it, meaning that we'd have to do a PICL approach to just do a block of the bursa. Um, and the other thing I wanted to do was to make sure that we had no leakage from any of these bursa around the spinal cord and probably almost there at that point where I could do this, meaning if we have leakage around the spinal cord and I put an anesthetic in the bursa, then we'll get a high spinal block in that patient and we'll have to resuscitate them. Um, so haven't had any takers yet, um, but maybe you could be the first one, we'll have to see. Uh, and clarifying the difference between a bursa and a panis. Yeah, bursa is just a lubricating sac that's up there. The panis is just, a swollen lubricating sac that may or may not be scarred down. Um, so it's the same thing. It's just a description of what that looks like on an MRI. A 
panis is. Uh, Mark, will the inner osseous ligaments need to be injected with fluoroscopic guidance? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to inject uh, intra-articular into the joint. The only way to be certain you're in the joint is to use fluoroscopic guidance um, with contrast confirmation. Not an easy injection to do. For example, for every 100 physicians that inject the SI joint using fluoroscopic guidance and contrast, I would imagine that there's about a 50-50% miss rate. Um, even when they think they're in the joint with contrast, they're probably not. It's one of the reasons why I published on a very specific type of injection uh, to up the chances that you're in that joint into the 90% range and being able to do it quickly and efficiently. Um, so yes, you'd have to inject intra-articular, you'd have to use x-ray guidance with contrast confirmation, and you'd wanna make sure that you see a perfect arthrogram, which is kind of what I was alluding to uh, just before. Uh, Diana, it's safe to get TMJ, TMJ injected in other Regenix clinic while you're away. Um, in my experience, most of the Regenix clinics haven't done a lot of TMJ work, so I'd be concerned there like anything else. You're gonna want um, someone that does a lot of that, so I would call that specific Regenix clinic. Get an example of how many TMJ patients they treat a year. Um, at Centeno Schultz, just myself alone, I probably inject uh, 100 to 200 a year. Um, amongst the other doctors, I think it's a little less common. So maybe there's another 50 cases in there, and that's with five doctors. So um, you certainly want to see uh, a doctor who's doing at least 50 times a year, something like that. Um, yeah, Diane, I, I saw your email there. I think I answered your question, your, your email question, but I'll try to get to that sometime today or over the weekend. Bonnie, uh, is there a criteria that indicates uh, when to treat the TMJ? Um, yeah, I mean, the TMJ would be treated when the TMJ is a problem. So the kind of criteria that we would use would be problems with chewing, uh, having to change your diet, or if the TMJ seems to be causing substantial temporal headache. Um, those are the criteria that we would tend to use to treat the TMJ. Uh, Diana, can severe TMJ disorder present and look like severe CCI? I've had both, but bobblehead and dizziness better when you realign my jaw manually. Uh, not usually. I think what you're noticing there, and I've talked about it quite a bit here, is that there's a connection between the TMJ and stabilizing the upper neck. So what ends up happening is as the upper neck stabilizers go offline, those anterior jaw muscles and the strap muscles take over. Uh, if your TMJ is not aligned, uh, then that's not going to be an efficient stabilizer of your upper cervical spine. And if they align it, it becomes a more efficient stabilizer of the upper cervical spine. Um, so again, they're just sort of uh, playing one off the other, but we generally don't see TMJ patients who have CCI-like symptoms. Uh, amen, I plan to have a poster of PRP in my country. What's the worst case scenario for this operation, please? The doctor touched the nerve, the pain be chronic, would it get better? Um, uh, what's the worst thing that could happen? Uh, spinal cord injury is probably the worst thing that could happen. Um, uh, other worst case scenarios, if it was an upper cervical injection, would be injecting into uh, the retrieval artery and posterior circulation, which would be a posterior circulation stroke. That would be a permanent um, stroke. Um, and things like permanent dizziness and balance, et cetera. Uh, as far as uh, damaging a nerve, that's also possible, just like the spinal cord injury. That could be anything from a mild um, exacerbation of nerve pain, and then it goes away to paralysis uh, in that nerve distribution. Uh, Finn, can CCI uh, affect airway area diameter? If so, typically was the mechanism. Yeah, Finn, I've got a whole blog on that. Let's see if I can bring it up for you. I did this the other day for a patient. 
You know, this is something we see a lot of in our CCI patients. So be really careful here if you have CCI because um, this is rampant in the CCI patients. And a lot of them really have not gotten it um, taken care of or even investigated that they have this problem. Uh, so uh, this is the blog uh, that I was talking about is snoring being caused by your neck. Uh, it's on the Regenix blog, uh, goes through the mechanism here. So that's the normal airway with air going through. And then you can see just pushing C1 a little bit forward can block some of that airflow. And if C2 pushes forward, then it's even worse. That can block a lot of that airflow. Um, and obviously, if you have all of those uh, vertebrae coming forward, which happens a lot in kyphotic patients or when you have a loss of curve or reversal of curve, it's going to impact the airway. Um, so anyway, that's the, the blog to go and read that goes through that. If you just go to the regenix.com website, that's two X's. You go to search here and then type in just snoring and neck, those two words and that should come up. With regards to patients getting cleared uh, by or for the clock PT, is that something that generally happens post procedure appointment four months following should patients reach out ahead of time for that clearance? So if you are extremely, um, if you're doing very, very well after the procedure and you've made big strides, um, then we would approve it before that four month mark. Outside of that, we'd wait till that four month mark. Uh, let's see, uh, what is phenomenon prolotherapy? Is it recommended? I'm not quite sure what that is. Uh, phenomen prolotherapy. Maybe there's a, a misspelling there. That's, that's possible. Um, let me know if that's misspelled or not. Uh, I know you only use saline and dextrose. Um, yeah, so we tend to use dextrose prolotherapy, which is 12.5%. Uh, the the add-ons to that that we will use oftentimes is platelet lysate. Um, uh, Jennifer, uh, thank you. I don't want it. This has been more reason to decline the steroid. Yep, for sure. Uh, by then, German spine doc, not USA, said he likely was having brain stem strain from convex curve, 23 degrees, and misaligned C0 to C1 cord curved, vestibular videogram positive for symptom central cord strain. Oh, it said you likely were having brain stem strain from convex curve. You know, I'd probably need to look at that, but to understand exactly and translate exactly what you're talking about. But certainly uh, that would be a good use for diffusion tensor imaging uh, to try to see if that strain is turning into actual uh, actionable damage. Uh, Sarah, for a new new patient who's looking for potential CCI diagnosis, what is the most direct route? With the schedule with. I'm asking for my partner with similar issues and don't know the most direct route since my journey has been decades long and quite roundabout. Uh, that would be, uh, uh, well, best thing to do is just send me an email personally. Um, that's probably the quickest way. That way I can send you directly to the right people. And uh, if you wanted to go through the clinic, uh, that's calling Centeno Schultz Clinic and then getting scheduled with, with ECs. Uh, or talking to her, it's actually ISIS, uh, but she's Spanish, so her she pronounces pronounces it ECs, and she would be the schedule. But if you just want to send me an email uh, to my desk, which I put it in the comments up there for somebody else, that I can get you to the right person. Uh, Duck P, uh, how much or? Much like how strong neck muscles allow the head to sit firmly on the neck, with the same be true in regard to the torso, strong scapular back muscles need to allow the neck to sit stably. Absolutely, yeah. So there's lots of muscles in addition that go from the high upper back 
uh, into the neck, even into the hypercervical spine, like the levator scapula. So, yes. Uh, let's see, with polychondritis, CCI symptoms was preceded by rapid onset two months, sternum and crunchy knees, elbows, post-COVID vax, now my ears are floppy too, no biomarker. Uh, yeah, so without biomarkers, you know, it's sort of just a, a box, a black box. Um, probably better to figure out what's causing that um, rather than just sort of accepting the black box. Uh, duck, I've heard different ways to describe hypermobility versus instability. How would you describe it? Uh, hypermobility just means that you're uh, more flexible than the average person. Um, instability means that you don't have stability at a joint. Um, now realize that half of stability is ligaments and half of stability is muscles. So there are lots of hypermobile people that are pretty stable because uh, even though their ligament stability is degraded, um, they're strong from a muscular standpoint and their joints are mostly stable. We then tend to see as they get older, so for instance, hypermobile EDS patient, where you start to get some degradation of that uh, collagen structure within the ligament of that joint, and they get weaker like we all do as we get older, or they're just not paying attention to it, or they're not active enough, or they're not, or they're sitting around too much, and then they dip over into the instability side. Uh, my vent, what is the norm for degrees of C0, C1 on rotation? Uh, the max is eight degrees based on a study by Dvorak et al. So it'd be eight degrees in rotation. Uh, anything more than that uh, would be excessive motion or CCI type 1D. Uh, uh, so 1D as in dog. Duck, uh, if scar tissue is a different collagen mixture compared to regular tissue, can injecting sclerosing agent benefit EDS patient? But a recent study of success with, uh, yeah. So, so yes, I, I think that that's probably the main mechanism in how uh, HEDS patients are getting relief with prolotherapy, not necessarily scar tissue. I mean, scar tissue means that you lay down collagen in a disorganized fashion. Um, as you load that, um, that then turns into just thicker collagen. So I think we are providing extra thickness of stretchy collagen for those patients and that's giving them some added stability. Now it's not as good as someone who, has, who makes normal collagen, but it works pretty well. Uh, Finn, uh, thanks for the blog, Link Dr. Centeno. Looking forward to your reporting MRI. Maybe you'll see why the airway is narrow when you analyze it. Sure, Finn, just remind me to take a look at the airway. We normally don't, but we can I can certainly look at it and see if it looks like it's having any specific uh, issues. Uh, Rishi, uh, do you know what the long-term damage may be if someone has chronic head pressure, headaches caused by CCI for a long period of time? I mean, that would be very different for everyone and it would depend on what's causing that. Um, there's about a dozen different causes for uh, pain in the head and head pressure. So that's a hard one to answer um, in CCI patients. Sarah, I'm interested in purchasing a C collar for activities that I can tolerate yet. Um, It seems like uh, petite people struggle to find a collar that works for them. Do you have any recommendations or models of brand for petite people? Yeah, Sarah, you know, the best thing I always recommend uh, to a patient is buy a cheap collar off of Amazon and, um, and change it. So you'd want to uh, maybe try something like a Miami J collar um, or even just a standard hard collar and go ahead and modify it. You know, if you buy it for 20 bucks, you won't feel so bad if you cut it up and it doesn't work. Um, but that's, if you're a hard fit, that works the best. You're obviously gonna wanna get the smallest ones. You're gonna wanna get uh, a cervical collar in the 20 to $30 range off of Amazon. Should be a hard collar. 
Um, and you're going to have one, one that can be sized so that you can buy a small or an extra small and then make other physical changes to it, cutting a little there, cutting a little here. And then if it doesn't work, you know, no harm, no foul, you spent 20 or 30 bucks. Um, that's what I generally recommend to patients. Uh, Diana, does TMJ injection strengthen the ligaments in the disc and thus pull everything back to normal joint alignment naturally? That's the goal. Diana, can Atlas be holding for a while, but ligaments still damage, or, or, or is this a sign of healing? Um, well, you can certainly improve an Atlas holding by improving your overall posture, or in your case, by improving uh, how the jaw is aligned. Um, so I think that's a good sign. It doesn't necessarily mean a sign of healing, but it's a net positive for sure. By then, how is the bone structure of occipital condyles determined C zero rotation of 11 degrees? Um, yeah, I think what you're talking about is that CCI type 1C, um, and there we're talking about the condyles that usually fit into the atlas. So it's a, it's a shallow ball and socket type joint. Now what can happen in some patients that are born with flatter condyles and a flatter joint, and that can cause additional sliding. It may also cause additional rotation. Um, and it's that shallow condyle. Now there's an actual, um, there's an actual uh, measurement that and ratio that you can do. I'll see if I can find it for you here. That was part of a really interesting paper where they were looking at patients with carry zero who were symptomatic and theorized that they had these shallow condyles. Um, so let me see if I can share this with you. So this is what I'm talking about here. Uh, this was a study where they measured, you can see there off on the right here, uh, A and B, uh, A being the width of the condyle on a CT scan, and that's in the middle of the condyle, and B being the depth of the condyle. Uh, and then they just took uh, B over A to get this C0 to C1 ratio. And what was really interesting was in the flatter condyles, where the ratio was below 0.17, uh, those patients all had symptoms. And then with the deeper condyles, where the ratio was over 0.206, none of those patients had symptoms. And then there was the middle ground of the overlap. Some of them did, some of them didn't. But I think what they proved very nicely was that if you've got intrinsic stability uh, at C0C1, C1, because your condyle it sits very deeply into the atlas, you're going to fare better, right? It's going to be harder to make that person unstable because just they've got bony stability um, in addition to ligaments and muscles that hold everything together. But if you have a flat condyle, then you're really just hanging on your ligaments and muscles and you get no help from the bones. So you're much more likely to be symptomatic. Sure, Sarah. Uh, do you have any advice on how to deal with a flare up from symptoms? Um, yeah, the biggest one is usually just finding a, a trusted uh, NUCA or AO chiropractor. Uh, that tends to work really well for probably 70% of the patients we see. Uh, obviously, a lot of that depends on why your symptoms are flared up. Uh, and that would require a hands-on exam uh, to figure that out. Uh, if I'm doing a phys or doing physical therapy and feel more unstable afterwards, is it likely I did some damage? Not likely you did some damage, but a lot of patients can't tolerate, a lot of CCI patients can't tolerate physical therapy. They tend to crash and burn. Um, so, you know, they learn pretty quickly that it just isn't a good fit for them. Um, and that tends to be active physical therapy. We're going in or having to try to do some exercises. Obviously, they're trying to help, but without the intrinsic stability, 
um, what we tend to see is more instability happens when they get pushed. And uh, then that leads to a flare up in symptoms. Now, usually that's not a permanent uh, thing. And usually that's not permanent damage. Um, okay, I think those are the questions I have here. Any other questions that I can answer from anyone out there? Um, today, we were uh, talking about uh, the use of diffusion tensor imaging with uh, fractional anisotropy measurements. Uh, it sounds super complex and super geeky, but I think it's a, uh, it'll be a very nice tool for us to figure out who is having some spinal cord injury uh, versus not, and it'll be very, very helpful for clinical decision-making. So I'm look, really looking forward to getting some of those scans uh, back next week. Uh, AT, what percentage of patients uh, do you treat that are taking medications prior to treatment? Um, I would say probably half of our patients are taking some sort of medication. Um, in that half, uh, very few of them are taking narcotics these days. Um, uh, probably 10% of that population. So that's good news because 10 years ago, it would have been almost all of those patients because of the whole Oxycontin thing that we had going on. Um, but fairly high percentage. Levan, uh, why not radiology reports measure this stuff? Rotation numbers as listed and no eval was done for rotation. Seems flexion extension I only discussed. Um, it's not easy to do. That's why. Uh, in fact, I just did this uh, like, uh, on two of the patients I saw today who were from Germany um, via telemedicine. Um, they all had rotational MRIs. So I measured C1, C2 on those. And it's not easy to do. Um, now I've gotten used to doing it, so I can do it fairly quickly now. But it's one of the more complex measurements and it does have a substantial margin of error. Uh, because it's really impossible to get it to be um, to be a low margin of error, error measurement uh, from the way these things are measured. Um, so it just takes longer, and that's why they're not doing it. Um, realize the average reading radiologist, at least in the United States, in order to make a good living, has got to plow through more than 100 films a day. Um, so that means unless you want to sit at a computer for 12 hours, that means that you've only got a few minutes with each uh, film, and then you've got to document that, and then you've got to bill it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you're not going to see most radiologists do these complex measurements because it's, it's, it's hard to do. It takes additional time, and it obviously slows you down quite a bit. Uh, James. Are there a lot of physical therapists familiar with CCI? Or is it really just chiropractors who seem to know about it? You know, I would say that NUCA and AO, chiro AO chiropractors um, have got the PTs beat here by a mile, meaning that, yes, there are a few physical therapists that are familiar with CCI. Uh, we like the IPA physical therapist, IPA like the beer. Um, and if you go online and look up IPA physical therapists, they've got them in different parts of the country. Um, but, you know, uh, for every one of those physical therapists that understand something about CCI, there are probably 20 NUCA and AO chiropractors. So that's, that's the problem that uh, we see. Edward, at what point does ADI become a neurosurgical issue? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I would have thought that it was five millimeters or more, but we've sent a seven and eight millimeter patient um, and the neurosurgeon didn't bite. Um, so it's a good question. I think it probably also depends a lot on the type of neurosurgeon you see. That was just a local neurosurgeon and not really a CCI literate neurosurgeon. So I suspect that for those neurosurgeons that are out there, they're probably going to, ex that, that do a lot of CCI work, uh, they're probably going to accept uh, a lower ADI before surgery. Um, but a lot of that will also depend on how symptomatic the patient is and how disabled they are. So you got to realize that there's the measurement, but then there's the effect of the instability. 
And so if you have a highly functional pa patient, they're probably not going to operate on it. If you've got a patient that's circling the drain with a seven millimeter ADI, they're going to be more likely to operate. By then, my spine is so crooked, it would seem nearly impossible to get a baseline. Yeah, so just realize, a van that scoliosis leads to rotation. So the rotation that you're seeing could very well just be all due to scoliosis. Uh, AT, do patients that are not on neck collars and not on medication seem simply better in general? Um, well, so if you're taking narcotic medications, that's a problem uh, always because it rewires your central nervous system in a bad way. It makes it harder to manage that patient postoperatively, and it makes anesthesia higher risk. Now, if we're not talking about narcotics, then it's less important. And then when it comes to neck collars, that really goes back to uh, the function level of the patient. So for example, if we have a highly functional patient, that patient is more likely to be a one and done treatment and become highly functional after they're treated. If we have an extremely low functioning patient who can't get out of bed for more than an hour a day, that patient's gonna be much harder to get back to anything approaching uh, normal function. Edward, uh, I've read online that the transverse ligament is a very inelastic ligament that usually ruptures in all or nothing pattern. Do you think that's true from your experience? No. Uh, but again, you have to realize that from a, a surgical standpoint, whether it's the transverse ligament, the ACL ligament, um, uh, the UCL ligament in the elbow, um, you tend to see binary thinking. It's all or nothing. The ligament is fine or the ligament is completely ruptured. Now that's total BS. Um, there's no credible data that would show that, that that's a realistic statement. Uh, we've got tons of data, for instance, that show that ligaments get into a lax position or they that if you do stress testing of any joint, including uh, the one you're talking about here, the Atlanta dental inner space, uh, you're gonna see patients who, ha you're gonna, uh, who have a stretched out ligament probably 10 to one on a completely torn ligament. So I think you're hearing uh, the world uh, explained to you there by a surgeon who only looks at it from a binary standpoint. It's fine or it's completely ruptured. Um, regrettably, that's not what the actual research says. That's not what reality shows. Um, it's just a way to conceptualize, does someone need emergent surgery or not? Uh, any opinions on creatinine? Not really, not, not when it comes to this stuff. Can imaging with DTI show issues with phylum terminale? Um, it's not gonna show issues with a phylum terminale, um, but it certainly may show um, what many of the occult um, tethered cord folks are concerned about, right? The whole concept behind occult tethered cord, and again, we're not talking about tethered cord, that's a different thing, we're talking about occult tethered cord, is that there's too much pulling on the spinal cord, and that pulling is beginning to lead to uh, problems within certain parts of the cord. So for example, the issue with um, bowel or really bladder would be the conus medullaris. So uh, a great way to look at that would, would, would be to take a diffusion tensor image through the conus uh, in someone who has bladder problems to see if we're starting to see damage there. As I've said, bladder problems are very common in women with back pain. Uh, we see them all the time in women with back pain that don't have any occult tethered cord so this becomes very, very hard to figure out. And DTI might be very helpful in showing whether or not there's actual cord damage happening within uh, the conus. Mind curve is from Klippel-Feisty, maybe Klippel-File syndrome. File infused block C7 hemivertebra. Gotcha. 
Yeah, so that's a problem, you know, nothing you can do about there. If your hemivertebra is off, um, you're always going to have a curve as a result of that. So that's a, that's a hard one. Um, just again, realize that when the, the side or when the spine side bends, it almost always rotates. And so that 11 degree C0, C1 rotation you were talking about could very well just be the long-term consequence of that side bend. Uh, let's see, do you think nurse nurse and a concussion specialist in training complex spine will be CCI literate? No, not even close. I, I, I think that we have, uh, I think I counted six neurosurgeons in the world that I would put in the CCI literate category. That's all you got. Um, I'll give you those six names right now. Uh, I've got my own opinions about each each one of these, how aggressive they are, how conservative they are, et cetera. Uh, we've got Fraser Henderson. I featured some of his work today. He's in Maryland. We've got Dr. Patel. I believe he's in South Carolina. Uh, we've got Dr. Bolognese up in New York, New Jersey area. I think that's three. We've got Joel Frank down in Florida. That's uh, four. Uh, we've got Gillette in Barcelona. I may be missing somebody, or maybe there's five. Uh, but it's a very small list, a uh, very small list of doctors who do CCI all day, every day, who um, can even read an MRI um, and say, yeah, that's a surgical candidate, and that's not. Um, so regrettably, uh, we have there a, a disconnect. Um, but if I was thinking I was a CCI surgical candidate, those are, that's the short list of surgeons that are out there. Anya, do urinary issues that you mentioned with no OTC get better after regen injections? Um, yeah, Anya, so for instance, we see lots of women, for example, with urinary bladder issues uh, that get better with a caudal epidural with platelet lysate. Um, so yeah, you have to be extremely careful um, because remember, urinary issues are extraordinarily common in women with back pain. Um, and all you gotta do is go to a clinic that treats women with back pain and just ask them. Uh, now, the funny thing is most of them won't volunteer it. So most docs that see them never ask that question. They're not urologists, why should they ask that question? They expect that if a patient's having a real problem there, like they can't hold their bladder at all, and they're peeing on themselves, that the patient will tell them that, and then they'll go there. But they're not asking that question in general. Do you have problems with urinary urgency or frequency or dribbling? Um, regrettably, it just doesn't get asked. But if you ask these patients, it's rampant. Probably about half of all women with chronic back pain that we see have problems uh, like I described. So um, trying to claim that that's due to an occult tethered cord wouldn't be your first choice. You'd want to treat the back first and see if it goes away um, and not uh, assume it's an occult tethered cord problem until absolutely proven otherwise. Uh, Magpie, can prolotherapy up with spinal cord abnormalities and damage? No. Um, so there's no way to repair the spinal cord using prolotherapy. So that's why in this discussion, if somebody is having spinal cord damage due to an obvious uh, instability, then you're gonna push that patient uh, much more quickly towards the surgical option. Uh, if someone's not, or is having very little, then you can obviously try to fix the instability through other non-surgical means. Uh, by then, rotation is dy dynamic. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, but just realize that the problem there is that because you have rotation due to the scoliosis, the joint is going to get stretched out and it's going to want to accommodate that. So there may be some CCI there, but realize that the cause of the CCI may be the scoliosis itself. And so you can tighten down those ligaments and certainly help some of the CCI but you're gonna be chasing the curve, meaning that's a patient that's probably gonna need repeated treatments to, to do their best to stay healthy. Um, 
Okay, let me go ahead and stop the share there. Um, okay, guys, any questions, any other questions I can answer here? Um, okay, I think I've got another meeting I'm supposed to be at, although it wasn't at, it wasn't on my uh, schedule, so I'm going to have to get running here in order to catch that 2 o'clock meeting my time. Uh, okay, guys, I want to thank everyone for their time today and their great questions. Um, and uh, happy uh, to see you all today. You have a, a fantastic weekend. And I will uh, be here on Monday. We'll have another topic and get to some of these questions I didn't get to. So uh, show back up on Monday and re-ask your question, and I will get to that question. Thank you so much.